in Christianity today, in Christendom today, we've got bloggers who are always outraged, YouTubers, angry mobs on Twitter and TikTok who attack pastors and their ministries telling partial truths and misrepresenting reality. And Christians not only eat it up, which is bad enough, but we repeat it. I heard that pastor was abusive, or I heard that pastor was a false teacher, or I heard that pastor was shady. And sometimes we'll say things like, not to gossip or anything. <laughs> Listen, repeating false witness is the same as bearing false witness. You repeat something you heard, whether you know it's true or not, you might not have fashioned the dagger, but when you repeat false witness, you might be the one, might as well be the one driving it in. False witness is the non-physical version of murder. False witness murders a person's reputation. It murders their livelihood. It murders their, their peace. It murders their legacy. It murders their potential in a lot of ways. So let me give some examples. Like last week, Pastor uh, James McDonald was preaching on stealing, which was a great message. He said stealing includes stealing someone's reputation. And that's what happens when we bear false witness. Rights come from God. The right to property comes from God. And whenever God gives us rights, that automatically obligates others. God gave you the right to own property that obligates other people not to steal it. God gave you the right to create your own reputation. And that obligates other people not to smear it. Now, I want to talk about James McDonald, because it's a good illustration of this. He has alluded to this on several occasions, although he hasn't gotten into it, about how he's experienced a lot of pain in his past. And it was exactly due to this injustice being committed against him. He founded a church, and he built it over 31 years, from nothing to 15,000 people. His radio ministry called Walk in the Word would reach 5 million people a week. I listened to it before I ever met him. Just think about, does that sound like someone that maybe the devil would want to attack? Yes. And it was. It was destroyed because people bore false witness against him and believers allowed it. Why? Because if we're being honest, we like scandal and we naturally distrust leaders and we don't obey the Bible. Now, James, my friend James, he never claimed to be perfect. Uh, no pastor I've ever met has been perfect, <laughs> including me. He's admitted that he's made mistakes. He's confessed publicly that he's had problems at times with his anger. Um, and going all the way back to the apostles, every pastor or preacher has sinned, <laughs> right? Everyone besides Jesus. If perfection was a requirement to preach the gospel, there'd be nobody preaching. There would be no pastors, right? But he, James, was falsely accused of things he didn't do. And that led to him being unjustly fired and his reputation murdered with his corpse drugged through the street and many of the same people he led to Christ spitting on the body. This caused indescribable pain for him and his family. But for us as Christians, it's so easy to hear stuff like that and believe it and repeat it because... Often we care more about a good story than obedience to God. Let me go back to my definition. False witness is any misrepresentation of reality, a lie, a partial truth, or a twisting of the truth that hurts another person in any way, regardless of intention. So I'm going to continue with this illustration with James. One example that's easy to understand, he was accused of mishandling church funds. And I think, man, if someone really mishandles church funds, that's a huge deal. That's pretty much a deal breaker in my book. But it wasn't true. He had total accountability and elder approval of his spending and independent audits, but it's easy to take a partial truth and misrepresent reality to hurt people, especially when we're talking about leaders. So for example, over a few years, he spent $180,000 almost taking men from the church on hunting trips. Okay, wow. That's, that's a lot. That's a lot of money. And if you, if you heard that on the surface, 
you might think, that sounds kind of weird. I mean, I, I can think of some of you, you know, maybe you're in retirement, you're living on a $50,000 a year pension, you're counting every penny, you're super careful with your money, you don't even buy name brand cereal. And then you hear this pastor spent almost $180,000 taking men from the church on hunting trips, you see? And, and it's, it's a true statement, actually. He did. But if that's all you share, it's easy to turn it into false witness because it's a partial truth and a misrepresentation of reality that hurts another. Even if you add a disclaimer, well, I don't know if it's true, but here's what I heard. Here, here's the full story. The full story is he did this with the church elders' approval, took business leaders from the church on fundraising hunting trips, and over that time period, those church leaders gave, those business leaders gave to the ministry $8.4 million. Now, I know we're not all good at math. Like, I don't claim to be a math expert, but do you think that that was overall a good thing for the church? Right, I think so. You know, here at our church, we got about a $9 million budget. He was leading a church with a $26 million budget. You know, not to make anyone feel bad, but most of us don't run organizations with $26 million budgets. So you could imagine there's probably some dynamics there that we wouldn't understand if we're being humble, right? Here, listen, though. Not understanding the full story doesn't excuse twisting the story. Just because you're like, oh, I don't really get that. But here it is. It's easier than it's ever been to destroy a leader with false accusations or really anyone. Of course, there are leaders who do terrible things, and they should be held accountable, but there's also a terrible enemy who has evil schemes to destroy. It's so easy today to destroy someone's life with a simple accusation because believers just eat it up, and they don't listen to what God's word says. So our friend James, he's now going through the legal system to systematically and legally clear his name, and he's winning on every count. He just... And that's good, that's justice. But even as he clears his name in court, that doesn't automatically repair his reputation, which was damaged by false witness, because not everyone who heard slanderous things is gonna hear about the court decision. So here's why God encoded in the Bible, in his word, a protection, especially for church elders. Let me just ask you this. If God said something in his word, even if it was clear but difficult to understand, would you believe it? Would you, if God made it clear and you didn't like it, would you still accept it? See, false witness against a church leader hurts not just the church leader but the people in the church. This isn't a sermon about how we need to protect pastors because ultimately what, what happens is the people in those pastors' ministries get devastated. And pastors love their people. That, that's the thing we're here for. Here's what it says in 1 Timothy 5. Re read this carefully with me. It says, do not admit a charge against an elder. The NIV says, don't even entertain an accusation except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all. And I've done that so that the rest may stand in fear. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. Let me just break that down for you. It says, you don't even take it into consideration. You don't even consider. You don't even accept a charge against a church elder unless there's two or three witnesses. And that's implying either eyewitnesses, not like I heard it from somebody, or somebody who has evidence. And then when you have two or three, then you start considering it. Here's another thing it's telling us. It says those who persist in sin should be rebuked, persist in sin. Because all pastors are people and people sin, all people sin. So, so if a pastor does sin, there, there are certain things that I think if a pastor does it, it's probably a deal breaker for that guy at that church at least, right? But if he persists in sin, like he won't repent, right? That guy should be fired, but otherwise not automatically. And then it's telling us here, you catch that last statement, 
in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging. This is so serious that if you're going to make an accusation, which sometimes you do have to make an accusation, if you're going to repeat it, if you're going to consider it, consider that you're doing this in the presence of God and Jesus and the angels. They're watching. They're watching. And here's what Jesus said in Matthew 12. I tell you that on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. There's going to be a lot of people giving an account who were living in our times. But how often do you hear a Christian repeat false witness and slander against another Christian or, or a pastor? I often hear Christians calling pastors false teachers today. I spend way too much time defending pastors I don't even know or like that much because people are calling them false teachers unjustly and, and that's not right. You have to understand the difference between a false teacher and a person in error. Everybody makes errors. To err is to be human. And so there's a difference between, oh, you said something wrong. Like I look back on some of the sermons I preached when I was young and I was like, I did not say that right. I've even had some services where I'm just like getting so fired up and then like you say something and you're like, ooh, <laughs> take it back. <laughs> that, that was a misstep, right? There's a difference between making a mistake or having a bad position versus persisting in directly contradicting God's word. So I'm gonna use a few different examples here. There's a guy called John MacArthur. He is a brother in Christ. He's going to be in heaven. He has done a lot of great Bible teaching. He's written a lot of great commentaries, but he does not believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are in operation today. He's even had some very critical words of people who think they are, like me. Here's the thing, I think he is wrong on that issue. I think he's dead wrong, I think he's in error, but that does not make him a false teacher. Now I'm gonna go to the other side of the theological rainbow. There's a guy named Joel Osteen. He's on TV. He feels like it's God's calling on his life to encourage people and give them hope. He is a brother in Christ. He is going to be in heaven with us. But he gets a lot of criticism because he doesn't talk about sin all that often. And he doesn't talk about hell nearly as much as I do. <laughs> and, and I think that that's a mistake personally. That's an, I think it's an error, but that does not make him a false teacher. And yet you'll see people, you watch the YouTube video that calls one of these guys, oh, he's this. That, and you just start repeating it like, like you know when you don't know the full story. And just because you saw a YouTube video or read a Twitter thread or read a blog post, it does not qualify you to bear false witness against a believer that you don't know and are not in a position to judge. Okay, I'm gonna give you another example. This is on the other hand, I made recently, personally, I made a public accusation against a pastor named Andy Stanley for saying things about homosexuality that directly contradicted God's word. First off, I heard him say these things with my own ears. And I had a conversation with him about it for almost two hours. So it wasn't just like a misunderstanding. Also, as a pastor, I am in a position to call out another pastor for bad teaching. That makes a lot of sense. And then further, two other people who were there and heard it themselves confirmed that what I said was true. And also, I prayed about sharing this for several years and consulted with other church leaders and pastors on how to handle it because I saw him continuing to go down this road. I didn't want to do that. I didn't get any joy in it, but I felt a responsibility to do it. And hear me on this, just because there were three witnesses and I'm trustworthy, I like to think so, that still doesn't automatically make it true. It just means that according to 1 Timothy 5, now you've got to take it seriously. Because I'm trying to teach you how to handle these things properly according to God's word. Here, here's what I want you to understand. This is difficult for some people, but follow me here. Even when multiple people make an accusation, that does not automatically make it true. Some people wouldn't believe this. Really? No, it's true. Even when there are multiple people making an accusation, that does not automatically make it true. Why? Because people lie. In 1 Kings 21... King Ahab 
wanted a piece of property next to his property. It looked real good, and he wanted to add it to the collection. So he went to the property owner named Naboth, and he said, I want to buy your property, or I'll trade you for another piece of property. Naboth said, no, I don't want to sell you my property. It's been in my family for generations. I can't sell it to you. King Ahab went away sad. He's throwing a pity party. And his wife came home, whose name was Jezebel. You ever heard of Jezebel? She said, what's wrong, honey? He threw a little pity party. She said, oh, don't worry. I'll take care of this for you. She went and wrote letters in his name to the city elders and had them arrange false witnesses to accuse Naboth of cursing God and the king, which caused him to be unjustly executed, and the king got the land that he wanted. There were multiple witnesses, but they were false witnesses. Just because there's multiple people making an accusation doesn't automatically make it true. Recently, we saw the Me Too movement get a lot of steam. And it did some good things. There were some convicted predators who really did abuse people, and they were brought to justice, and that's good. But then it went too far when some people started to promote this slogan that says, believe all women. The problem with that is you can't automatically believe all women. Why? Because women lie too. I'm just, I mean, I'm curious at at this last service of the day, are there any women here who've never told a lie? Because if there are, I would love to breathe the same air as you and just like touch the hem of your garment. So you can't just automatically believe people because people lie. Same thing happened to our friend, Pastor James McDonald, after he was unjustly fired from his church based on false witness, some of the elders conspired with their attorney to defame him and falsify evidence against him. And a judge actually ruled on this on August 31st of last year, Judge Jerry Ezrig. He ruled that the elders who fired James and the church's attorney conspired to defame him, which is called crime fraud. And they lost their attorney-client privilege, which almost never happens. So that's one of those things you hear about it, and it sounds like a crazy conspiracy theory. And then it turns out it was actually true. I'll tell you what, if we've learned anything these last few years, sometimes you hear about a crazy conspiracy theory that turns out to actually be true. (laughs) So James had to take his case to the secular courts because believers didn't obey the ninth commandment. Jesus dealt with this same thing in Luke chapter 11. Look at this, it says, but some of them said, Jesus had just been casting demons out of people. But some of them said, no wonder he can cast out demons. He gets his power from Satan, the prince of demons. Onlookers bore false witness against Jesus, who was just trying to help people. If Jesus was perfect and got falsely accused by multiple people, how much more likely are imperfect believers and pastors to get falsely accused? You know, at Jesus' trial, he was arrested legally, and false witnesses were brought to accuse him of blasphemy. And he was convicted illegally based on false charges. Again, if a perfect man who never sinned once was falsely accused and falsely convicted, we have to be extra careful about accepting accusations against brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? So I'm going to wrap this up now, give you some practical keys quickly here. How to resist false witness. First, Refuse to listen to it. You need to be someone who says, I have no ears for gossip or slander or negative statements about people I have nothing to do with. Unless you're specifically appointed to a position of accountability, like a church, like like we have a church board and denominations that provide oversight and accountability. Sometimes you're in a position like that and and you should be paying a little bit more attention. But otherwise, we've got to say, I I don't even want to hear it. I don't even want to hear it. You know why? Because sometimes you think, well, I'll just give it a listen. I'll just listen to what they have to hear. Maybe there's something important I do need to know about. (laughs) But then the thing is, it's hard when you hear something bad about someone, even if it turns out it's not true, to let that not affect your view of them. 
Sometimes you hear about something like, like what I've talked about today, some of the things I've talked about. You, you'll hear about it and you'll be tempted to go check it out. Oh man, Pastor Ryan was talking about these things. I didn't really know about those things. Maybe I should go Google those things and check them out myself. I want to encourage you not to do that. Refuse to listen to it. Because you have to understand how this works. For every click, for every view, those people are getting paid. They're making money. And when you go check it out, when you go listen to the story, when you go read about it, you are paying them. You're incentivizing them to keep doing it, to keep bearing false witness. So don't even listen to it. And then two, refuse to repeat it. If you hear something that's negative about someone, listen, if you weren't there, don't repeat it. Don't turn around and and then be like, well, hey, you know, just between us. I heard this from someone else. I'm just going to share it with you, just you. You don't repeat it. Not to gossip or anything. I don't know if it's true, but I, but I heard, don't repeat it. In Exodus 23, it says, you shall not spread a false report. You shall not join hands with a wicked man to be a malicious witness. And when you repeat it, you are joining hands with the false witness. You know, the Bible talks about the accuser of the saints. The devil is constantly accusing the saints And when you repeat an accusation, you are joining hands with him in slandering the saints. When you repeat a false witness against someone, you're joining hands with not your heavenly father who wants to encourage the saints and remind him of his promises, but the enemy who wants to discourage the saints saints and tear them down. So don't repeat it. And then here's the other thing. Three, refuse to cave into it. Refuse to cave into it. Sometimes what will happen is you'll see someone that you know or love getting attacked and you'll feel real bad for them in theory, but then it's like, okay, peace. (laughs) Bro, I'm real sorry for what you're going through right now, but yeah, I don't really want to be involved in that. (laughs) Like, okay, I'll be praying for you from over here. (laughs) Don't be a fair weather friend. In Exodus 23, it says, you must not follow the crowd in doing wrong. When you're called to testify in a dispute, do not be swayed by the crowd to twist justice and do not slant your testimony in favor of a person just because that person is poor. And in Leviticus 5, it says, if you're called to testify about something that you have seen or that you know about, it is sinful to refuse to testify and you'll be punished for your sins. So I think a modern day example of this would be if you see someone that you know and love getting attacked unjustly, you have a responsibility to step in as a character witness, to encourage them, to rebuke the person who's spreading false witness. There's a responsibility to do that there. I think about what Jesus went through when he was getting tried in this kangaroo court. Peter was out denying he even knew him. I don't, yeah, I don't know that guy. <laughs> the apostle John, he was following from a distance Jesus is then getting tried for blasphemy, and he's watching outside like, ooh, that looks rough. But I I ain't going in there. Right? And that's what a lot of Christians do. You see someone else getting blasted, and you're just like, ooh. See, I've had people, when I'm getting attacked online, they'll, like, text me privately. Stay strong, Pastor Ryan. I love you, bro. And I'm like, listen, thanks, man, but if I'm getting attacked publicly... I would appreciate it if you loved me publicly too, right? It's so easy. We get attacked from all different directions today. You'll get like super right-wing conservative Christians who become pharisaical and they'll unjustly attack anyone that has a different position than them on anything. You're a false teacher. On the other side of the spectrum, you've got radical progressives who hate our biblical conservative theology, but they can't attack our theology. So what they do is they try to problematize the ministry. They try to stir up problems and drama around the whole ministry as a way of taking those people down. And a lot of people, they just get caught up in the emotion of it and they give in to the crowd. Don't do that. Here's the fourth thing. Consider valid accusations carefully, soberly, and justly. Don't get caught up in the emotion of an accusation against someone. If you are in a position especially to consider 
an accusation. Maybe you're, you're a boss and you have to consider an accusation against an employee. Or you're the principal and you got to consider something that happened with a teacher. you got to be thorough, careful, and just. you got to ask questions, get all the details. Who said this? Do they have an ax to grind? What might they gain if the accused is convicted? What does the accused have to say in their own defense? We have an important process in our legal system, which is based on the Bible's legal system called due process. Due process means you are considered innocent until proven guilty. And we've kind of flipped that in this day and age. It's like we're going to think of you as guilty until you prove yourself innocent. And even then maybe you're still guilty in our eyes. Due process is so important that our government will pay for you to have a defense lawyer, even if everyone knows you did it. Like you could be on video committing a crime. The government will still pay for you to have a defense because that's part of due process and it's necessary for justice. And then lastly, remember the consequences of false witness. This has serious consequences. It can destroy people's lives. And scripture has very stern language about false witness in it. Proverbs 6 says, there are six things the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. A haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. Revelation 22 talks about heaven and hell and those outside of heaven. It says outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. He was warning us. In Proverbs 19, it says a false witness will not go unpunished and a liar will be destroyed. When we start to hear negative testimony about someone... Yeah, if we, we weren't there, we don't know it. Like, we should be uncomfortable with that. Like, we, we need to get more uncomfortable with that again. Like, oh, you know, I don't really want to be a part of this. Like, I don't want to hear this, right? Because the stakes are so high. Now, we know that there are people that do wrong. And in this world, our, just, our justice system doesn't always function perfectly, does it? Sometimes innocent people don't get justice. Sometimes evil people get away with wrongdoing. And that's a tragedy. But the good news for us is that in the end, there will be justice for everybody. You might have been victimized in this life, and maybe the person that hurt you was never brought to justice, never caught, never convicted. And that hurts. It's hard. But there will come a day when the Bible says that Jesus will judge the living and the dead for everything they've done, every thought they thought. And there are evil people that get away with their evil deeds in this day and age because they're powerful and they have money. But there's going to come a day where every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. He will judge the great and the small, everyone, for their deeds. Now listen, we hear about that and we tend to think about the people who've sinned against us getting justice. We don't always think about the fact that we too have sinned against others. And we've got justice coming for us. And the truth is that unless something changes for us, we're going to pay the price for our sins. God has a record of every thought you've ever thought, every deed you've ever done. And you know, we talked about the accuser of the saints. He is in the throne room of heaven before God, accusing the saints day and night right now. He's standing before God talking about you. You know that he did this. You know that she said this. You know nobody knew it, but he got away with it. He did this thing. She did this thing she said she wouldn't do anymore. He did that thing again. He calls himself a Christian, but he's doing this. And the devil is trying to skew God's love for you. But he can't do it because God's mercy is new every morning and his love is faithful. And there's going to come a day when that changes. In Revelation 12, it talks about the end times. It says, and I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down. He who accuses them day and night before our God. 
they, that's us, have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. It's like, for everyone who believes in Jesus, we had a rap sheet, it's true. We've done things that are wrong, it's true. But we conquered the accuser by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. That means that Jesus, who was the perfect lamb of God, spotless and sinless, allowed himself to be sacrificed in our place. His blood was shed so that yours wouldn't have to be. And the blood that Jesus shed covers over your sin so that God doesn't see your sin. The blood of Jesus washes us white as snow, the Bible says. And so whereas the devil made accusations against you, that's not the end of the story. Through faith in Christ Jesus,